Hello, everyone. Welcome to our one-to-one -one marketing, eight steps to effective personalization today here. We are so excited to have you all joining um, here as we explore marketing's future through the lens of personalization and technology. I am Ashley Topping here at Exclaimer, and I am super excited to be sitting alongside um, both my uh, past and present uh, of uh, future of marketing here, of uh, Gina Hortatos, the CMO of Hacker One, and uh, Carol Howley, the CMO of Exclaimer. Um, in today's digital ecosystem, where every interaction counts, we're finding that the importance of that personalized engagement cannot be overstated. And so it's really crucial that we're driving our conversations and guiding prospects through our funnel efficiently and effectively. And so um, intention truly is key by inviting both Carol and uh, Gina here today. Um, they both bring alongside each other a wealth of knowledge and insights from a series of vast experience in the tech industry um, emphasizing the critical role of personalization in both cybersecurity and email signature management. Um, but before we dive in here today, I'd like to invite both Gina and Carol uh, to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their perspectives on the evolving landscape of marketing and their pivotal role um, in personalization um, throughout their careers. So Gina, why don't you get us started here today um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience in the journey of one-to-one. -one. Sure, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Gina Hortatos. Currently I'm the head of marketing and community at a company called Hacker One which is a cybersecurity company where uh, companies who want to tap into ethical hackers to try to find the vulnerabilities in the system before the bad actors do, uh, tap into our community of 2 million strong security researchers in order to do that. Uh, long time in B2B tech, I, I won't even say SaaS because I was doing B2B tech marketing before SaaS existed, really. Um, and uh, with you know 25 plus years of experience in B2B tech marketing, uh, personalization has certainly been part of that journey. Uh, starting back in the day when we were buying lists and just blasting spam and trying to get people's first names right, all the way through to what we have today. So I'm really excited about this topic today. Looking forward to digging in. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and Carol, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Of course, yeah. Um, I, my name is Carol Howley. I'm the CMO at Explamo. We're an email signature solution platform. Um, so we're not anything to do with kind of blasting mass emails, but very much kind of that personal email that you have, you know, you through your outlet cadence when you send an email from yourself to another person, another contact. Um, it's that personal email. And um, we've got around 60,000 customers now and growing really fast. But one thing that we've really seen is such a fascinating trend is how, I guess, how our marketing is evolving and how we're starting to really look towards personalization in the same way that, you know, Gina was mentioning, like how interesting it is at the minute to sort of see those changes and how you can approach things. So for me, I'm really, really thrilled to be here. I'm really thrilled to be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is very much along the lines of personalization. I guess in my career, I've been fortunate to lead marketing teams in the, the tech sector. I've been around a little while as well. I won't go into how long, but definitely edging the, the very early stages of SaaS, if not before. Um, so I've worked in uh, Skyscanner and Canonical are the two biggest companies that I worked in most recently, very much on the IT and, and sort of hacker side of things and a lot more than now where we're, we're really selling to marketers. So it's, it's a very fascinating journey. Amazing, uh, amazing. And thank you both for joining uh, us today. We're so excited to be diving into uh, personalization. I know it's uh, something that a lot of us are really trying to crack the code on, um, especially with all of the noise out there. And, um, you know, we all sit um, either behind a device or with a device in our hands um, for the majority of our day. And so there's a lot of communication coming at us um, on the daily. And so it's breaking through that noise. Um, and how do we do that as well? so, 
Um, I know that considering the pace of technology advancements and the customers, ex our customers' expectations rather, is truly evolving and the call for a strategic playbook focusing on moving back to the basics um, is really just um, getting louder and louder on the daily. So Carol and Gina, um, talk to me about what that looks like at um, your companies and um, what that approach is uh, like for you guys when it comes to developing your marketing strategy, what that looks like from a funnel approach and things, and how does that tie into your long-term uh, strategic planning? Uh, you know, when we think about things like AI, for example, it's really easy to think that we have the easy button, right? Of just hitting go uh, and things. And so, uh, Gina, I know, for example, when we were catching up here last week, you have some examples uh, and things of uh personalization gone wrong for example so yeah why, why don't you kick us off sure um i think the first part of the question was really about you know what what does that playbook look like um so i'll start there and then i'll i can talk to the personalization gone wrong i think that the uh the more things change the more they stay the same um and i think that the playbook regardless of what technology you utilize how you structure your teams how you go about putting pen to paper on what personalization you seek just like most other things in life to get what you want you have to know what you want and in this context it's about really understanding the buyer that you seek um and as basic as that sounds it's surprisingly difficult especially for startups, right? For many good reasons. If you're a startup that's still struggling with product market fit, for example, you might not know exactly, you know, how your value proposition, how your unique differentiation is gonna land with different audiences. So you're just kind of trying a bunch of things. You're also under the you know, under pressure to make payroll or talk to your investors. So every deal, every dollar, we're not turning any customer down is kind of an ethos in those early years, but, um, Marketing really needs to take the lead in insisting that there be intentional study and work to really understand who your buyer is, what they care about, how your how your unique value uh, could ha had, uh, add value to their lives. And then how do you actually like reverse engineer and how to get there by understanding what their purchase journey is, what their buying jobs are along the way. Um, and so that's what I mean by back to basics. There is no, you can use AI to help streamline um, some of the steps involved in doing customer journey research and so forth, but there's no substitute for intentional interviewing with your target market and writing down the things that they say about value proposition and making sure that you're translating that into your positioning properly, prop making sure that you understand what their buying jobs are so that you can show up where they are in their journey with useful content that they feel is relevant and personalized to them. Um, that is a grind. It's hard work. And it's work that requires prioritization, intentional focus. Um, and it's also the kind of work that is, it's almost like exercise. It's like the most important thing for health and longevity, but it's the first thing to fall off the plate when things get busy. But you have to maintain that discipline because without that, without that deep understanding, updated regularly on how that buyer buys and what they think about and what makes them want to engage with you in particular, um you you're next thing you know you're just in a sea of sameness with everybody else so um that's what i would say about the about the basics um we can get to the personalization gone wrong later but i'd love to hear carol's perspective on this uh, yeah absolutely of course um and i completely agree with you like every point that you've made you know completely agree i think it's I think growing a company in a, and doing marketing is a really challenging game and i think you know actually we mentioned it a lot about how we just need to work smarter not harder but it really is that investment in the basics that i think is the key element it's sort of sitting back and looking at what those fundamentals are like it's really you know a lot of companies are really quick to kind of jump in and write a subject line or run a new campaign or have you know a new idea without actually sitting back and thinking what's the messaging and when would that come in and when's it relevant to people and how do you set up that kind of whole process for everyone so i think it's kind of sitting back and really kind of 
going through your go-to-market problems, as you say, approaching the customer journey, understanding who those core personas are, making sure that everything's you know right in the right order. We're talking to people properly, and also you've joined up that journey because I think one big thing that we always say is that the customer doesn't care whether it's marketing, and then we throw them over the fence at sales, and then you throw them back at customer success, and then yeah. your marketing comes back out. It's it's kind of that whole journey is so important, and people are so quick to see through things that don't work for them. I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that oftentimes we talk about that very first touch point um, and how important that that touch point is um, and things to right? because first impressions are everything. Right. And so um, it's just like dating <laughs> and things. And so, um, it's all very relevant. And that experience that we provide um, makes an everlasting impact. Um, on the buyer and so i think that we have to think about that experience from the very first touch point whether it's an ad um a face-to-face -face interaction so on and so forth and so um that strategy is really really important uh so um carol talk to me a little bit about where technology fits into this um and things and how you see the advancements in technology um, enabling a better personalization experience uh, for marketing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of almost like a loaded question these days, I think. Um, right. <laughs> you know, I think um, there's really, I guess, we're kind of coming out of what's probably been a bit of a downturn for a lot of companies. There's been a lot of elements with budgets being cut. There's been a lot of kind of stress for people. You know, I know for us, like we were saying, the whole work smarter, you know, not harder. You've but by the way, you've got less budget, there's less people, you've got enhanced privacy regulations, you're not going to have cookies, you've got AI disrupting everything and people being concerned. So there's this huge kind of almost like volatility in the marketplace that is a, a fascinating time and you can't really in this situation, I think, cut corners to kind of generate demand. You've got to really start investing really effectively in the basics. So making sure, as we said before with your messaging, but also starting to value, I think, more that proper communication. And there is this fantastic opportunity with AI, I think, to scale really fast and companies that are, you know, investing in really good content, using it really well, you know, connecting, automating and scaling can have this huge advantage, I suppose. But it sort of almost comes at the, the risk of kind of that um, personal touch being lost, I think. And, you know, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to do with our team is to invest in that, that element of AI and start to kind of really amplify everything we do at speed. Wow. And really at scale but then you know sitting back and kind of adding that personal touch you can write blogs so quickly but then sitting back and being like you know does that really kind of talk to what i think and what's my opinion and how do i bring that to life and you know is there any real life examples or genuine learning i can add to this so it's actually making sure that while you do take advantage of this incredible opportunity we've got you can actually then kind of make it more authentic and and i guess kind of fight that mass general generalization that you get with ai and you know while you're still working at scale you can still use it really effectively so I think that's probably one of the biggest things that that we're seeing and how that then kind of ties into your brand strategy and your communication strategy and that ability while you've got you know so much more hopefully free time and um, you'll be able to do a lot more personal approaches a lot better communication maybe a lot more one-to-one -one things so for us that's a fascinating move I guess as we can automate so much more of our processes we can start to do more creative activities I think yeah I think that's a really important point i mean carol ashley and i we all market to very different audiences but they're some of the toughest audiences right you market to marketers and marketers are practitioners of their own craft and they're the ones that are going to be picking apart and and you know trying to see if this is this age ai generated i market to cybersecurity professionals they have no tolerance for you know anything inauthentic factual inaccuracy and 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 they are very intolerant of any personalization at scale that goes wrong and i do think that that authentic touch that one-to-one -one, um you know making sure that your audience understands that you understand them as people and you're trying to have a dialogue with them is going to become more and more important over time i mean if you're in um if you if you talk to people in your peer group there's already starting to be dialogue uh, you know in, in private chats and so forth around you know how can you tell if something is ai generated content and everybody knows when it's happening but you can't really put a finger on it they just know it's not generated by a human um so that that interplay of of um of 
using AI technology well for scale, for speed, for uh, buyer understanding. You can't not think about the authenticity and maintaining that authenticity at the same time. Buyers are too smart and they're not going to tolerate it. A hundred percent. And I think that there's an opportunity to like, um, to consider like in an analysis of uh, data, things like that, like for scale mm -hmm. um, and things I am um, interestingly enough was having a conversation with my sister-in-law who is in HR, completely different, you know, uh, job function. And she mm -hmm. was, I have no idea how to use AI, you know, but I know that I need to. And so we had this whole like conversation and, she, but by the end she was like, you have me convinced. Right. And because she was viewing it as this, I don't want like to sound like a robot. And I'm like, it, like, I hear you. Yeah. Let's like take a step back and it's, here's how you can actually like, you know, mm -hmm. use it to your advantage. However, um, to work smarter, not harder. Um, but then don't just take it at the, you know, base value of what well, it's Yeah. I also think we're at a kind of a, a interesting spot as marketers, because there's a lot of machine learning that has been built into current tool sets. And we use the word, we use the term AI with a very general brush when personalization at scale has been around for years. I mean, some of the examples I gave you, Ashley, last week of personalization gone wrong. I mean, everyone's gotten the email with the wrong person's name on it, right? Which is like basically 15 years ago, which is a bad mail merge or bad, you know, no one scrubbed the data and it your, your name ended up being somebody else's name. And that's enough of an eye roll. But um, even now, uh, people are working from home. My husband and I both work from home. I received a... Um, a uh, chat bot, you know, I was on a website and the chat bot popped up with an attempt at personalization. And they said, let us offer you this white paper to see how our services can help your company. And they named the company. It was my husband's company because it's his IP address that they were picking up. Now we both work out of the same house. So those are the types of things that you really need to think about as you look at your tech stack and you look at your integrations and you understand how you're personalizing some of this old stuff is, you know, people are, again, are, are going to look, take one look at it and be like, I know what you're doing. So, and you're doing it wrong. So you should probably stop now. Um, and that will be even more amplified with the true AI tooling that's now available. Totally. I think it's fascinating. Like it's almost like this kind of new age of mass personalization is possible. Like, you know, we've been inspired by everything. And I guess, you know, picking up, we always look, I think in B2B, it's fascinating to learn from a B2C element and look at things mm -hmm. like Amazon and Netflix. And yeah, you know, every customer has that experience in their own home. So they expect us to deliver the same experience. Like I, I would expect people to reference the company and to reference what I do and possibly what I've done. Mainly, I guess I'm a marketer, so I'm judgmental, but also, you know, you just expect that kind of level of personalization and understanding standing, knowing, your, knowing what you want and your need. And I think, you know, with the facilitation that Gen AI, Gen AI has that to tailor to people's needs really individually, really quickly, you know, pick up on things, you can train the models to kind of do so many things. It's so fascinating. And I think we're just kind of at this point where we've got almost this like real time data, this ability to answer at speed mm -hmm. and also kind of bring in personalization. It's just like, to me, it's such a fascinating area that it's going to be such a huge shift this year. We actually have a question in from the audience um, that I think is uh, very relevant here to this conversation. So Nathan is um, joining us from San Francisco. So welcome, Nathan, um, and has a specific question around buyer interviews and insights. And so he is curious on um, starting interviews with existing customers. Um, and so he's just getting started. And so he has a question around, are there any traps? Do you have any tips for finding interested buyers who haven't considered your specific solution? Um, I guess um, 
one of the kind of I guess for new customers a really good way is can is putting something on your website you know obviously you'd kind of drive demand to your website but what we found is really fascinating is to interview people on our website and to run surveys and you know there's some great tools you know obviously there's loads and loads of tools you always feel bad mentioning one but I really love winter and kind of running some of our pages through there and getting feedback you, know, you can sort of say you know can you give me an IT feedback can you give me marketers you know within a certain area or seniority and you can get them to feedback and they give you such fascinating insights sites on you know some of your messaging your positioning we rebranded in june last year and about a month in it was fascinating for us with our you know our wonderful brand that we thought was incredible to run some of our pages through and actually get real feedback from marketers saying you know, actually i don't really understand what you mean here or how does this work and you know, start to collate that so in terms of new customers for us that was a really great way and then also we do a huge amount of work with communities and you know it's mm -hmm. To kind of like just put things out into community just for you know advice sometimes, but also to get feedback, making sure that you can use things. So it's it's really great in that sense. Um, I think there's a question for you, Jean. Have you used Winter for cybersecurity? I used it for IT when I was at Canonical, but yeah, we have not used Winter for cybersecurity professionals, but we employ a lot of different techniques. Um, there are absolutely traps only talking to current customers, right? It's friends and family. Um, and so they'll be as honest as they can, but you know, just like any other thing, you, you need to make sure that your audience is more representative of the buyer you seek. Um, and so, uh, you know, plus one to Carol's comment about working with communities to try to find um, interviews with people that represent your arch archetypical buyer, but might not have bought from you yet. Um, that's actually a slightly different, I think, questionnaire. Uh, you want to ask a lot of the same questions as you ask your customer panel, but you also want to ask more about their buyer behavior. If they ended up not buying anything at all, that's a tell and understanding what that process is and that buying job is and that conclusion. And also if they bought from, you know, somebody else, uh, what understanding what that is too, that, that stuff is gold. So, um, I do think that there's a place for, you know, going out to research panels and doing a combination of that quick hit qualitative or quantitative, just ask one or two questions. Uh, but you definitely want to seed in, I mean, it's not a statistically significant sample size, but at least five like detailed 20 minute interviews with uh, people who represent your buyer who don't um, who don't actually buy from you. Um, and, you know, honestly, the way that we do it is is through referral. We ask for uh, our we ask our friends and family like, hey, do you have other CISOs or VPs of uh, InfoSec in your community that you would like introduce us to just for these research purposes. People are very willing to give their opinion. Um, and so we haven't had a problem there. Um, but it's so important to have a well-rounded view because if you are only asking your internal people or your very best customers, you're gonna be a part of an echo chamber that might end up not serving you pretty quickly. Amazing. Yeah, I think that there's a lot to be said there. Um, and even as we see, uh, you know, the evolution of community engagement here, I think that uh, leveraging communities uh, for testing for um, your messaging and uh, personalization is a really important outlet. It's actually um, a key place where we often are like just even just sharing information um, with our research, for example, um, and or tapping for research um, uh, audiences as yeah. well. And so a lot of times like um, we may be commissioning research as um, like out to our US yeah. audience, um, for example, um, but then also sharing that same survey uh, to our different communities and things. And so um, I think that that's an important area that we can be tapping. So um, Gina, obviously as the owner of community, at mm -hmm. Hackathon, what are some of, um, or how rather do you foresee the role of communities playing um, in the one-to-one -one, uh, personalization? Yeah, yeah. Um, it is, I mean, community-led growth is, the way, you know, uh, nobody can sell you better than the than the, your customers and your partners and your ecosystem. Uh, community at HackerOne means something a little bit different than most uh, B2B SaaS customer uh, companies. 
most of the time it's either a customer community or a partner community or we also have we have two million strong uh, ethical hackers as part of our community as well we're, we're essentially a two-sided marketplace that matches uh, companies with ethical hackers that can help them so what our our balance has to be because you can't be too salesy you can't be too you know it's our community and you'll do what we say absolutely not it's like by the community for the community and the company who's you know kind of facilitating it really does serve to facilitate it allow time and space and forums for people to talk to each other to learn from each other um make sure that the resources are there for uh customers and hackers and partners to be able to have the really you know get the best use out of out of out of your your company's offerings and you really have to be very careful uh not to be too heavy-handed and, and kind of let them do their thing um that has been uh we've been very successful in that area uh, i think most of the best communities look like that where you just kind of let the people have their forums and make sure that you're supplying the infrastructure and space and opportunities uh, for the, that dialogue to happen. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Carol, what are some of your uh, favorite communities that you're um, a part of and or leveraging um, through Exclaimers Marketing Strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, we're kind of a lot earlier in terms of building a community. We've recently started in the last kind of six months, just looking at, you know, building out a marketing kind of, I guess, a forum, not necessarily a, a community where we've, we've offered for people within our, within our kind of community and within our customer base to join a bigger, a bigger forum to help us with things like beta testing, to give us advice, feedback, and, and that really early stages of community. So we've got a lot and probably need to pick your brains, Gina, in terms of like, how do we start to kind of really do that? And really facilitate those conversations that's what we're really trying to invest in in terms of other communities we we don't really kind of work with communities necessarily for it to be kind of monetized or, or trying to have that it's more for a lot of the time it's for my team i love for the i love for them to join to learn to kind of be with other marketers and i think that's where you really spark those great ideas but for us it's very much just being part of that ecosystem that network joining in things like webinars and opportunities obviously we absolutely love the rev genius uh community as we're we're here as well but you know it's a massive amazing learning opportunity and some of the people that you bring in for speakers i really like kind of listening to some of the dave gerhardt things and some of marketing against grains the podcast but they've got a fantastic community behind it through the hubspot community and um, they're sort of probably three of my my favorite communities right now and we also work with bigger networks like the the ana network over in america and with things like tech nation in the uk so really depending whether it's sort of variety or, or marketing audiences but our biggest thing is just to kind of i guess like to a degree amplify our, our brand strategy to get awareness but also to learn and to have that opportunity for my team to kind of do different things and kind of almost stand on the shoulders of giants I think is the best thing for community because you just have so much opportunity to learn such a rich kind of um a rich kind of uh, like kind of network of people but also ideas as well amazing um Samantha asks what tool have you built your community on I'm looking to build out a community for my company and we have Squarespace as our backend platform, which uh, kind of sucks. I'm wondering what platform or tool you have used. Um, so for this, we're actually at that evaluation stage. So we haven't made a decision. I don't know if maybe that's a better question to pop over to you, Gina, if you've got any advice on tools, but we, we haven't settled on that yet. And we have been using Squarespace too for things. Yeah, I think it really, I mean, just like anything else, when you're evaluating tool stack, it kind of depends on what you want yeah. um, and where you want to start. So if you uh, really want to index on providing uh, easy access to the knowledge base and to, uh, you know, tech support and, and you know, and, and so forth, that's one tool set. If you want to have a more like, just give me a giant box full of stuff that I can use, whether it's gamification and incentives for advocacy or, um, you know, forums to allow partners to come in uh, and and uh, be part of the community as well. You know, that's you know, like the old school stuff like Influitive that's been around for a really long time. I've used it a couple of different places. Um, at, uh, 
at HackerOne because our community is so ethical researcher oriented. Uh, we have a variety of tools that we use and it's really more about making sure that there's two-way communication between us and our our community and then there's like a, a really good chance for them to interact with each other and that's kind of a different tool set um, that we uh, both bought and built. Uh, so there's no easy answer, but you have, like I said before, before you can get what you want, you got to know what you want. So be really crisp about your requirements um, and what those needs of the communities are. I mean, one of the best communities I'm in is a kind of a private CMO community that really just consists of a private Slack channel and a weekly call. Um, and so, because we're all marketers and, you know, we, we gravitate to forums like that. We don't need a lot of gamification or at least not in this community. We don't need the full, you know, forum uh, uh, requirements, but um, that's very different from, you know, if you really need your cust, if you are really seeking advocacy and you want to incentivize your community to do, you know, references and speaking and that kind of thing, that's a whole different tool stack and more expensive. <laughs> way more expensive yeah i think that defining those requirements up front um success metrics uh what success looks like is really mm -hmm. important um because then you have a, a goal post to measure against uh long term which is really important uh so that way you know you're not six months in and feeling like you failed uh, the only other pro tip i would give ashley and carol is staffing think about how you want to make sure that you've got the right resources. Um, for many years, I flat out rejected the idea that marketing should run community. I always thought it should live in product um, because it should be, you know, we don't want marketers to get too tempted to get too heavy handed with their community. Um, and quite frankly, a lot, of the, a lot of the communities I worked with in the past were a lot of the questions were asked around, you know, very specific technical things that that product really had to address. And so it made sense for the community management function to live in product. Um, I think that's evolving, but do not go into community building and investment lightly. You really need to think about stewarding that community and that requires incremental time. And uh, at least, you know, you, you need to, to, to model that out. If it's not an FTE right away um, and it's a half of a person's time, Make sure you have that figured out before you actually pull the trigger and and buy a tool. No, I think that's really good, really good feedback, and it, it just you know that tool is such an important part, and it, it does depend so much what you want. I know that I love you know the Slack kind of elements of community because you have that ability to have the free chat, but you know if you're wanting to leverage anything in terms of reviews or investments or you know referrals, then you know it doesn't really work. But actually getting you know advice and feedback instantly is just fantastic. So. For sure, for sure. Um, let's see here. I feel like we could go so many different directions here. Um, but one of the things that I think um, is really important when it comes to personalization, especially from a global uh, strategy, and obviously Gina coming from the cybersecurity space, and um, Carol, uh, you're headquartered here and or located in London. And so this is something uh, that you have to worry about as well is security, compliance, um, and things as well. And so given the heightened emphasis on cybersecurity, um, what do security measures look like when it comes to like aligning a personalized approach to um, protecting customer information um, without diminishing that experience of one-to-one -one, um, and things? So uh, Gina, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I work for a cybersecurity company and we definitely put our money where our mouth is when it comes to our own security practices. So my examples and my experience might be a little bit like heavy compared to non cybersecurity companies, but we can't stay in business if we don't, if we are not ourselves secure by design. And so I go back to the back to basics and I remember, oh my gosh, what, what year was that when GDPR passed? 2017, a long time ago. Uh, GDPR took three months of my life in a conference room at Highland headquarters in a with legal and external uh, counsel and 
uh, sales apps and we were trying to figure out like what this actually meant because this law was giant and unwieldy and vaguely written and we did not know how to, we had to learn on the fly. Thank you, 2018, uh, to, to translate that into useful practical steps so that we wouldn't be fined because uh, the fines were very heavy if you messed this up. GDPR was the global data, data privacy uh, regulation that passed in the EU. And it basically said people can opt out any time and you actually have to prove that you deleted their data and all this stuff. And so that was my first trial by fire in terms of how marketing is heavily influenced by uh, privacy laws, but it should not be a compliance first conversation. It really is. You don't want to talk to anybody that doesn't want to talk to you. So continuing to know that buyer, continuing to enter into dialogue with them in the places where they go to find information. Um, the, all the basics, you all, everybody who's on this call now knows the basics, explicit opt out and making sure that um the way that people enter into your database is all through sanctioned ways and that you have uh, good data uh, protection data storage policies and procedures in place all of that stuff is table stakes but what it's really about is knowing your buyer understanding what's valuable to them and as we all know only about five percent of buyers potential buyers for your offering uh, in any given time are actually in market to buy. And so that 95% who is not, uh, there are ways to keep them warm through um, intent tools that don't even provide, they can't even like find that uh, exact person in their PII, their personally identifiable information, but they know their IP address. And so you can reach them through those means. And then through like one-to-one, -one. I mean, you gotta be careful with, uh, making sure that any sends you do through marketing automation or, or you know, any of the sales outreach tools, um, the list is clean, the list is opted in, and that anybody who opts out gets processed appropriately. But the stuff that you send one-to-one -to, -one to a contact uh, that you, you actually have a connection with or you're trying to get introduced to, um, that's really your opportunity because uh, you can put content in there that you can't get uh, from some of those mass personalization tools and you've got a much better chance at not getting a nasty note back saying delete me from all of your comps. Right. Um, absolutely. I think it is it is that basic thing and I think for us operating in multiple different kind of regions and, and sort of countries is really fascinating to see the difference in terms of the, the laws and what you can and can't do in different countries. And I think for us, the, the approach we took, obviously, I know we're coming from the UK, but we felt that, you know, we really believed in the privacy laws and the rights of the customer. And we wanted to make sure we operated globally with the same level of, of behaviors, I suppose, that we felt were right and that would applied in, in kind of the UK in line with GDPR. So we actually operate globally with the, the sort of highest level of, of sort of I guess privacy and, and personalization and it means sometimes you sort of look at things you're know, like maybe we could do you know a hard fast sort of dirty route and pull in some data but actually you know it's something that we're really really strongly avoiding and making sure that we've got those transparent practices because I think it's it just helps with that authenticity and it's you know ultimately mm -hmm to your brand and what you you know what's important to you and what you stand for and for us it's you know we're really we obviously work within the active directory for companies you know we connect into their kind of email their you know their private company data so we always want to be you know as secure as as sort of good as we possibly can with all the accreditations and everything that we can do so for us it's really important to have those robust security protocols in place to make sure that we safeguard everyone's data we hold ourselves to account as much as we can and then we kind of you know can customize with in the limits of that and, and really look at personalization there. So I think for us, it's, it's important to kind of do that and have that opportunity. So, you know, and it still gives you that ability to be personalized, to do really great things, to, you know, really interact on that one-to-one -one level, respecting those, those kind of individual preferences, but actually start to drive those really long-term relationships and drive that success together. So, you know, that's sort of the, the strategy that we've taken in terms of our approach that I think really stands out. I totally agree. And I think to, I mean, at Exclaimer, obviously there's, we are one-to-one -one because we are taking that approach from a, um, email, like your one-to-one -one email experience. And so, um, that personalization, uh, starts there.
uh, from your one to one email, which is great. Mm -hmm. and when I think that something that's really important to me, I'm passionate about is um, cultivating an innovation, innovative culture. Um, gosh, tongue twister of cultivate and culture uh, here. And, you know, I've spent my entire career in SaaS. And so obviously working with a bunch of IT people and I have really mastered the IT buyer. Thank you, Gina, um, for uh, really ensuring that. Um, so I actually, uh, for those that don't know, um, started my career in um, IT as uh, really focusing and honing in on the IT buyer. Um, and then was hired by Gina at Highland to stand up that function. And so anyways, all of that to be said, um, really have honed in on um, innovation throughout my career. And so when you think about fostering a culture of innovation um, and experimenting, uh, one of the reasons that I came to work for Exclaimer is because for experimentation and um, really kind of understanding what we're trying to accomplish and um, also uh, driving an experimentation culture as well. And so uh, Carol, talk to me a little bit about uh, how you drive and foster a culture of innovation and experimentation and personalization strategies um, and what kind of impact you're seeing uh, cross departmentally uh, from a collaboration standpoint um on those initiatives yeah so um i guess from ai we we kind of everyone is super excited i think everyone is at the minute and you know we've started looking at what does our tech stack start to look like in terms of what we're wanting to work with what companies you know have really great ai tools how we want to leverage it everything's changing so fast so you know a lot of the team are doing you know their own research they're starting to apply things we're doing a huge amount of work with Jasper. So we bought Jasper and we, we're starting kind of doing a lot of our writing with Jasper, but you know, across all the other tools, looking at how we can plug them all in. But I think the biggest thing is just encouraging that culture in, in your team of sharing, of failing forward, of testing things, of trying things out. I think for us, that's kind of a really great way of getting everyone on board and, and really kind of applying it across the whole company and starting to get everyone kind of testing things out, trying things, experimenting. Because I think one of the biggest things that, that I really took away from a recent report in the Harvard Business Review is that you know, AI isn't going to take your job. It's not going to replace marketers or people necessarily. But what it will what will happen is that someone who's using AI or tooling or, you know, all the modern kind of elements, it, you'll be replaced by somebody who can use those better than you that is experimental, that has that growth mindset that's testing and learning all the time. And I think that's the biggest thing to kind of bear in mind and to really, as a CMO, encouraging the team to, to be at the forefront, to be learning, to be kind of experimenting every single day is something that I'm really, really passionate about. Amazing. Gina, what about you? Yeah, the uh, a lot of the the same uh, plus one on on what Carol said. The job market and B two B SaaS has been very volatile over the past couple of years, um, and volatility breeds fear and the need for like wanting to be safe. And so, a lot of my challenge as a leader over the past couple of years has been to continue to try to drive a culture of innovation in an environment where people like just are a little bit seized up, right? Because we were in the pandemic and everyone was just like, we had to be innovative then because everybody was staying home and trying to, you know, continue that connection. Um, and thinking about how you operationalize that. Uh, we do a monthly what's working, what's not call in marketing so that we can actually talk about the stuff that where we think is going really well and the stuff that we tried and didn't work. Um, so to normalize the reality that things aren't going well and also to make sure that we're learning from those things. Um, at HackerOne, we have a, a saying, you win or you, we, we either win or we learn. Um, and the faster we learn, the better off we'll be. Uh, and so really celebrating, almost celebrating the things that we learned from is just as important as celebrating the stuff that's going really well. Um, and that also has a, I mean, this sounds a little bit, you know, squishy, but fostering a, a, just a culture of psychological safety where people feel like they can go out and experiment and they feel like they can go out and, and, and do testing. And if they, if it, if, if the test fails, that they actually have a conduit for us to like 
talk about it as a team and learn from it and figure out what we're going to do as a next step is so important. Um, the only other thing I'd say on this topic is it's so important. Marketers are at the tip of the spear. Um, I think that we are also the suggestion box slash complaint box. Everybody has ideas on how we could market things differently. Um, I wouldn't like to tell you the amount of times people came up with the idea that we should do a Super Bowl ad over the years. I'm like, oh, all right, maybe someday, but you know, we're back in the day. I'm like, we're five million in ARR. That's a Super Bowl ad cost ten million, right? So like, let's not let's let's table that. Um, so the other thing, but but in all seriousness, good ideas come from everywhere. Um, and so being able to, and again, it's all about the operationalization. Your team can either get inundated with great suggestions and not know what to do with them, or you can put a really simple process in place, almost like a suggestion box to say, hey, listen, thank you. We're going to put it here. Anything from what, you know, our competitors at XYZ show, you should do that. We should do that to, to, hey, I was talking to a customer or somebody on a plane and I got this brilliant idea for a campaign, have a, have a place for those things to be uh, uh, submitted and then have a usual cadence with your team. Like, let's go through the suggestion box and let's see what people have to say. And maybe we, maybe we test some of this stuff, but you know, always get back to them and be like, okay, great idea, but it's not really part of our strategy right now. Or, Hey, listen, we're kind of taking your idea and, and running with it or uh, kind of riffing on it, but thank you for the suggestion. So that's like both in within marketing and in with like cross-functional collaborative teams, you can foster a culture of innovation. I love the, um, the, the what's working, what's not meeting. I think that's really, really great. And, you know, I, I think it's just amazing to get people to have that culture of being really open. And one of the biggest things everyone's like, yeah, we ran this campaign and it got one sign up. And it's like, you know, getting people to actually be like, but, you know, why was that? What did we do wrong? How can we make it better? How next time will it be amazing? And getting people to switch that mindset, I think, is just so essential for marketers because otherwise, you know, there's so, you know, you are essentially playing poker in a sense you're playing risk you know you're making your bets you're placing your bets you're you know you're playing your hand and you can't always guarantee where things are going to lie so getting the yeah. team you're not going to win every time no exactly and it's like that blend of data and kind of that art and science element and then taking a few bets and relying on your instinct and being aware that you know if you fail then it's such a fantastic learning opportunity as long as you do learn and not do it again <laughs> yeah right Totally. And I think sharing those learnings is really, really important too. And even sharing them with the world. One of the things that like I've really challenged my team with is like documenting and I say documenting, but it's like just capture like three bullets and write a LinkedIn post about it. Right. And share with others, because I think that you never know who is in the exact same shoes that you're in. And if you can help them, somebody's going to help you someday too. And so I think it's really important for us to all be sharing uh, with one another because we are all in these exact same shoes, right? Like as marketers, we're all fighting the same battles every day. And so I think that opening up the hood, sharing the stories, talking about the, the wins we're having, but also the things that we stumbled and scraped our knees and um, like what are those like what abouts and gotchas and and things along the way those are just as important uh to talk about and um we do a lot of like testing um we do a lot of testing um on my team uh and sometimes we are successful and sometimes i'm like oh crap um yeah. that one wasn't quite so good so um and we end it and you know, move on to the next thing. But we've had some really fun things that have come out of some wild, crazy ideas. And um, some of them even come from 11 year olds, you know? So you just, I think it's all about um, turning the chair and listening. And um, uh, as long as you're willing to collaborate and have those conversations with others and um, be genuine and authentic and actually have those that's where that community play comes in. The influencer play comes in, right? It's not about like pay to play always, but rather just being yourself and having that conversation. So yeah, it all adds to that authenticity, right? Especially if you have a campaign that comes from, you know, an 11 year old or, you know, yeah. somebody in your sales engineering organization who is talking to a prospect who sparked an idea. Um, 
those are the things that really make you stand out. Humans buy from humans and they want to know that you've got some sense of humor and that you can be trusted and and that can all come out in your campaign work and in your one-to-one -one work. Totally. I totally agree. Samantha um, actually has a question here. She asks, how have you found uh, Jasper to be? I purchased it, but not sure it's any better than ChatGPT. Perhaps I just need to spend more time with it and make sure all uh, our brand info and voice and product info is in there. Yeah, so I'll be totally honest, I use a mix of tools. So, and I think it's good to use a mix of tools because things, you know, all of a sudden ChatGPT will release something or another platform will release something. And, and I think it's great just to kind of play around with all the different tools. For Jasper, you do have to spend some time with it. You do have to take a lot of time. Um, one of our team kind of took over and, and was really kind of the spearhead for Jasper coming in, the training. You know, spent a lot of time, you know, teaching Jasper to help it learn our tone of voice. They also taught it my tone of voice, which made me feel really, really weird. Um, so you can click on a button of like explain his tone of voice, and then you can click Carol's, which as I said, it's, it's a bit odd, but you do have to put the investment in. You kind of need to take time, you know, really help it learn. And the same as if you built a model that like you have to kind of teach it how to how to behave. And I think the biggest thing now, it's all about the inputs you, you put in, the guidance you give, you know, and you think we're not kind of, previously, if you're building a website, you're working in kind of like, building kind of technology, you'd be very, very fixed in terms of your input. It's like, you know, your coding was always very fixed. Whereas now we're saying, you know, can you create me a blog post that, you know, talks to marketers about X, Y, and Z, but actually there's so many kind of nuances and so much interpretation and, you know, so much freedom and flexibility. So the more information you can feed into to things like Jasper and models, the better the quality of kind of the outputs you get. So I think it's really about putting that investment in. Can I say something about this too? Um... Think about security. Uh, Jasper is a clo has more security guardrails in place. I think it's a closed LLM. Um, if you are using chat, and I hope you everyone already knows this, but if you're using chat GPT, don't put anything in there that you would not be comfortable with your competitors seeing. No proprietary data, no, uh, you know, no intellectual property. So if you want to use um, uh, 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 LLM writing tool to distribute technical documentation or anything like that, like do not use an open, I mean, ChatGPT, there is a reason the company is called OpenAI. You're also, you know, training that model um, by virtue of the fact that you're putting stuff into ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is great for a lot of stuff. Um, but if you, if your requirements, for, you know, necessitate, like if you want to do uh, if you want to do next likely purchase analysis, do not put any data into ChatGPT. I mean, I think you can do redacted, but like the time it takes you to clean that list and make sure, make sure that that data is, you know, anonymized to the point where you can actually analyze it, you might as well just buy, buy, buy a closed tool. So please do think about security concerns and how you're actually going to use it. Great point. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree. And great shout, Gina. I think that that's something important to consider. And um, Carol's right. We have trained Jasper to have Carol's tone of voice. Um, also trained it to have my own tone of voice and things. And I do, I would also recommend, there's a lot of trainings out there as well um, that Jasper provides um, too. And so uh, there's actually one for demand done today, even, and I am by no means, um, influenced or paid or anything by Jasper, but they do have a ton of really good trainings. And so I would highly recommend uh, Samantha for you to even just like hop on some of their webinars and stuff too, because they've got some really good ones out there and, and things. And so I know that my team has um, taken part of uh, some of those as well. And it's, it's new. This is a year ago at this time, a lot of people weren't even using uh, Jasper or even chat GPT for that matter. So I think that, uh, we have a lot to learn still, uh, and how we can be utilizing it in our everyday and what that looks like is different for myself versus Carol or Gina even. So, um, I would just encourage you to, uh, utilize the training as well. So, um, I want to be sensitive to everyone's time and we, um, have five minutes here. So, um, all of that to be said, I do want to open it up to the audience uh, for any questions. Obviously, we've been answering as we've 
you know, kind of carried out this panel conversation. And of course, I want to uh, sincerely thank both Carol and Gina for joining me here today. Uh, conversation on one-to-one -one, uh, marketing and personalization here. I think obviously this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, authenticity is um, incredibly important. Uh, um, as marketers continue our journey here uh, and things. And so um, any other questions that you have, please feel free to add them into the chat. And uh, Carol and Gina are more than happy to answer them. And in the meantime, Carol and Gina, do you have any uh, final thoughts or uh, parting words for the audience? I was just reading an article. I actually was a headline. Let me qualify that. I haven't read the article yet, but uh, the headline was something to the effect of marketers will be clamoring for authenticity tech in the coming years. <laughs> and I read that and I was like, really? Like we're going to keep like creating these, you know, disastrous scenarios where we're using AI to create inauthentic content that we're going to like develop new tech to like make it more authentic when, why don't we just re remember that we're all human beings and we want to talk to other human beings. So I don't, I don't really have a, a opinion except for like, oh my gosh, really authenticity tech is going to become a thing. That'll be interesting. Oh my gosh. It's so amazing. Um, and it is that human to human element that I think is really, really important. Like as in before, you have this fantastic opportunity to go a pace and a scale with with content and things, but always, you know, people will see through that inauthentic content and and realize that it's kind of very machine written. There's loads of tips and tricks I've seen flying around of like how can you tell if it's machine written or not, and you know, it's it's fascinating. But I think you know as I guess it increasingly shapes things like search engine results. It's shaping things like reviews and, and network and content. I think it it will become more challenging for people to kind of discover you through search and also to know what's real and what's not. So I think an element for us and something that we've been investing in is, you know, recognizability, presence, your brand, how that stands out, being really clear, I guess, on the fundamentals and the basics to go back to what we were first talking about of like, how do you stand out in that ecosystem, you know, by being authentic, personal, a really good strong brand and clarity of messaging and, and sort of using those communications challenge channels that are really available to you so I think while budgets are tight you know there is that argument of what you invest in and I think it's really that that kind of really core elements of your brand and personalization and, and kind of focusing your demand gen around that for us anyway. Amazing and on one final note we've got one question here uh, what or which rather B2B brands are currently killing it in personalization. Any thought? I think Six Sense does a really good job. Yeah, absolutely. I love all the the things from Six Sense and the marketing, and we obviously use Six Sense ourselves, which gives us such a great opportunity mm -hmm. in our OBM activity. We also really yeah. like Mutiny as well for the website. I know we're evaluating different tools for our website in terms of offering personalized experience. You know, when you land, it's relevant. We've been doing a lot of manual. I think we've been fudging a lot of things while we've been testing and moving so fast. So we've been doing a lot of manual kind of experiences and personalization, which has been fascinating. Ashley's team's done the most incredible amount of campaigns, but actually investing in tooling to give us that full journey would be really exciting. Uh, qualified, I would also say does a really good job of that one-to-one -one experience. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. It has been my pleasure to sit alongside uh, the two of you. So thank you both uh, for joining us. And I hope that you all have a wonderful week. Um, and we will all hopefully see you live and in the flesh and one-to-one -one soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Thank you, Gina. Thank you.